myself to start. Uh, yeah, my name is Keith Curtis. I uh, titled this talk 2 fun 2 It seems like anytime anybody does anything with 2 2 you come up with your own acronym. So that was fine. Uh, it's titled An Outsider's Perspective on Ubuntu and Debian, and it's loosely based on a <coughs> talk I posted on my website. I uh, worked at Microsoft for 11 years as a programmer. I worked on uh, Windows, Office, MSN, Fox Pro, and Mobility. I uh, think free software kicks ass. I uh, worked on text engine for Bob. Uh, and this is the musings of someone who's uh, tra been trapped in the dark Seattle and Sweden for 15 years. I went to Microsoft because I wanted to uh, learn the craft of programming. I knew you can read a book about how to do programming, but uh, that's not enough really. I, I, I felt and I believe that you need to work with people, see code, and uh, yeah, I think it's a craft. I realize the issue of Ubuntu and Debian are uh, both emotional and old issues to many of you, and I appreciate your patience on both accounts. I have no agenda. I didn't know what Ubuntu or Debian were three years ago. I'm writing a book, and this is uh, three pages of my book. So the question is, can Ubuntu and Debian work better together? I think the answer is yes, uh, but of course, why and how? I think I personally think Ubuntu threatens Debian, and there are many examples of facts that you could use. Uh, at one is, for example, there are a few news articles about Etch's release. And another is that uh, I think somebody asked uh, uh, Eric Raymond what he thought about Etch, and he said he didn't really care. So I think Ubuntu needs Debian's help. I think it's buggy. I'll we'll talk more about that in a minute. And I believe that uh, the creation of Ubuntu was not meant to hurt Debian, but I do believe in the law of unintended consequences, and I think. Now that Ubuntu's been out for several years, there is data available. So that there's the theory and then there's data once think something exists. So I'd like to talk about two issues. The first one is efficiency, and the second one is can you build the universal OS? Uh, one of the things that surprised me when I went to work at Microsoft was that I was a you know 21-year-old guy working in Fox Pro. That was my first group, and I was junior and my boss actually was a genius and he had like written huge parts of the product and I mean basically there are two or three people if you, I don't know if you guys heard of Fox Pro but for one point in time it was like the fastest data, fastest PC database it was faster than a lot of server software and my boss actually was one of the two or three people responsible for doing that and um, I mean, he had just done huge parts of the code base and so and I was this new guy but sometime during the bug fixing phase he would kind of jump into my code to help me make bug fixes. And one of the things I found was that he actually did make the right bug fixes. Uh, because I had owned, I had built these subsystems and I was the only person really who understood them. So even though this guy was you know, much more senior than me, he couldn't make the right fixes. Uh, another interesting thing that happens at Microsoft is that when somebody's given a feature, they're given full responsibility for a feature. So for example, if you were to work on Word and your responsibility for the footnotes, you'd be responsible for the file format code, the UI code, and then the engine layout code. So, uh, and they did this basically for two reasons. One is it gave that person the holistic perspective on uh, the code, and of course also it made it very efficient for bugs, right? If it was if any bug in the footnote code came in, then you you knew exactly who to uh, hand the bug off to. Um, so, and one of the things I think that I see in the Ubuntu Debian community is basically that you've got because you've got these separate teams, you have basically split up the division of labor. And so, one of the things that you see happen right now is that I think. It, it, one example you can use is the uh, X or the modular X changes and basically the work was done in Ubuntu and then thrown over the wall to a person who basically doesn't know, really know anything about what the changes were and so this person has to get up to speed on this on all this code and it's this and so we find in for example Ubuntu that you have multiple uh, in the separate teams you've got multiple people working on X on the kernel on open office on Mozilla and GNOME KDE and so forth and you find lots of duplicate work and duplicate expertise being built up because the division of labor is, has been separated because the teams have been separated. So, and in fact, I uh, talked to the uh, Debian modular X maintainer. He told me that the patches were just a starting point for him, even though, of course, the person who did these patches was both an X expert and a Debian, a former Debian developer. 
because he had to get up to speed, pretty much had to start over. So, um, and I believe this is the biggest reason for the inefficiency between Ubuntu and Debian. Um, so today, Ubuntu does a feature, throws it over the wall to Debian, where it gets re-understood and likely improved. And now you have two people who bother to learn the exact same thing. And oftentimes, what you often find is that Ubuntu will take their patch and throw it away, and then accept the Debian patch. So, and then of course, even worse is when Ubuntu does a feature. This is uh, expertise that Debian is, no, is not necessarily get, getting, and so that you find that over time, the center of gravity is basically shifting away from Debian. Uh, and then Ubuntu's current list of features means that they are not waiting for any features from Debian. Uh, it does, did Ubuntu come with, uh, to this conference with any list of work items for Debian? And I believe Ubuntu is on course to completely grab the center of of the community. And I say that by looking at the set of, uh, the set of specs and work items that are posted on the Launchpad. So uh, another an example is the bug process. According, this is the bug process according to DCT. Ubuntu will find a bug, maybe file a bug in the Debian database, maybe Debian reproduces the bug, and now who's responsible for it? And will patches work unchanged between the two code bases? I don't, I don't know. So, and then there's some other impacts, like uh, Debian is often playing catch up and not seeing Ubuntu's changes. Um, the departure of Ubuntu developers robs them robs them of Debian's expertise, which I believe is one of the reasons why Ubuntu is buggy. Various, I've heard and I've talked to various people and they tell me that Ubuntu will make a hack fix and then they'll basically wait for Debian to do the job and I think if there was one community that wouldn't have happened. And then the other thing is that uh, I think many choices are arbitrary and eventually that will lead to divergence over time. If Suppose Debian were, for example, not to adopt upstart. Uh, I, you know, you can look at standards like HTML, and yeah, HTML sucks, but why, but why it's good is the fact that basically every computer on the planet can display it. And so really what's not so important is how good the standard is, although that obviously does matter. What's more important is that, that people have the same standard, and that whatever we decide HTML is, that we all, we all use the same one. Um, so next, I want to talk about bugs, efficiency with related to bugs. So uh, my personal opinion, and the only thing that's holding up uh, world domination of Linux is bugs. I don't think it needs any bolt of lightning features. Donald Rumsfeld says, uses the phrase, a long, hard slog, talking about the war on terror. And I personally think that's what, if for Linux to have world domination, basically that's what I think needs to have happen. Just keep plugging away in the bugs. And you know, fixing bugs faster is the only way to get there faster. So, and Ubuntu is swamped in bugs. In May 2006, they had uh, 10,000 active bugs. In May 2007, they had 30,000 active bugs. And I think uh, if Ubuntu had 1,000 contributors, where could they get 1,000 contributors? Uh, they could make progress on that a lot faster. I think the first distro with 10,000 contributors will win. So, and one other point is I think the current situation has challenges in this to the extent that uh, the uh, Ubuntu LTS snapshots Debian unstable. So I, it's kind of an interesting question, like what does it mean if you're going to make a long-term release based on code that Debian doesn't think is stable? So either it's stable or it's not stable. And then of course you have the other issue, which is that many of the bugs, I believe, uh, that Ubuntu is finding exist in Debian, but they're not in the Debian database and nobody knows about them. <laughs> So I, it kind of questions what's the point of shipping at zero bugs if there are a bunch of bugs that exist in Debian that just happen to be in another bug database and nobody's tracking them. Uh, and then of course efficiency relates to brand. I, I saw the talk, I mean, many of us saw the talk yesterday about HP support of Debian. And then you have to ask yourself, well, was HP going to support Ubuntu? And um, you know, if they were to support Ubuntu, they, they, which they could do, they, they have to ask themselves, okay, well, what are the financial agreements? What's the, the SLAs, uh, escalation protocols? What releases they're going to support? And basically, if, if HP were to support Ubuntu, it would be a bunch more work. And uh, it's an, basically, it's an increase, it's a tax for them. Now, given, of course, given the fact that the code is 99.9% .9 the same, you wouldn't necessarily think it would be a big deal for HP to just support Ubuntu as well. but 
Obviously, there are many other little details that matter to them. And then another example is do dev files work across one OS to the next? Uh, there was some time a year ago where Zimbra made this announcement that they were going to support a, um, they're going to build some devs for their collaboration suite. Now, of course, do those devs work on Ubuntu? Now, maybe they do, but anyway, it's an increased tax. Now, we, we can argue about how big the tax is, but it is, it is, it does decrease efficiency. And then there's, of course, a bunch of other infrastructure. There's bug tracking systems, security bug fixers, people are, I don't know, I guess monitoring the, in the system. 24 hours a day to push out bug fixes. And then there's source control systems, forums, build servers, et cetera. And that is, again, just additional taxes. And then one other thing I point I wanted to make is that you don't really need to build new infrastructure to add a feature. One of the, uh, the things I've heard about for why Launchpad was created was because they wanted the ability to um, work basically with upstreams or to basically link bugs between bug tracking systems. Now, I don't know if uh, Mozilla supports that, but if it doesn't, then that feature could be added. You don't necessarily need to build something from scratch to add particular features. That would kind of be like creating a new Linux kernel if it doesn't support your particular network card. So, and then one other thing about efficiency has to do with the community. I think Ubuntu is very exciting, and I think this brings in more, more people and causes people to work harder. And I think to the extent that Ubuntu is kind of sapping the excitement from the Debian community, it decreases the efficiency of Debian. And if, Debian's, if Debian is perceived as irrelevant, then existing Debian developers will eventually, over time, quit working or leave. So then my next, I'm almost done. My next little issue has to do with uh, can you build universal OS? So uh, Mark Shuttleworth has a line which is it's hard to know what Debian's goals are. And I think that's a very good question to ask because goals create a vision and bring people on board. Uh, Mark said that uh, Ubuntu is a few specific use cases. So um, uh, Debian's motto, I think, which is a good way to figure out what Debian's goals are, is build universal OS. I think that's a very good goal, um, supporting 15 platforms and 18,000 software packages is an incredible achievement. And I love my computer because I can just, so much stuff is one click away, built to work together. Now, sure, the apps can all use a coat of polish, but I think ultimately that will happen when Linux gets going on the desktop. So, uh, and of course, in terms of whether or not it's possible to build a universal OS, one could look at Wikipedia and the Linux kernel as a couple of other case studies. Now, there are uh, a number of Debian um, derivatives. In fact, uh, the creation of Ubuntu has precedent because there are 100 other Debian derivatives. But most of these are region-specific and don't really disturb the center of gravity. And one other little point is Ubuntu's model obviates Debian's model. If, you if you're creating a Linux for human beings, it really doesn't leave much left over for Debian. I guess that would be Linux for robots. So, and another point is that software is infinitely malleable. So basically, anytime you want to make a change to a code base, you can generally do it, and you don't need to go off and uh, create a different code base to make that happen. Um, so another way to attack this question is to ask yourself, what feature other than orange has Ubuntu Abbey added that Debian doesn't want? If you look at the various investments that Ubuntu's made around ease of use in the 3D desktop, <coughs> 3.6 kernel, faster startup, those are all, in my mind, examples of things that Debian wants. I think if there were things that you know Ubuntu was doing that Debian didn't want, that would uh, be a, an interesting point. So, and then another issue that you have is that I think uh, one of the things Ubuntu's added is better power management. And I think nowadays, if anybody who's using a laptop wants good power management and was a Debian user is probably now using Ubuntu, and the and the interest really in adding good power management to Debian. It has dropped off because anybody in the last two years who wants good power management is just using Ubuntu. So, and I, one of the things I find is the power management for lap, laptop support in Debian is several releases behind Ubuntu. So, uh, so one of, one thing that I talked with Sam about yesterday was he mentioned that there are certain things that Ubuntu wants that um, that Ubuntu doesn't want that Debian is doing. 
in the example he brought up was support for multiple platforms. So, and, but one of the things I find is that the kernel really hides 99% of that work. So the amount of ARM specific code you find in a random package is actually very small. And second of all, uh, if you support one 64-bit platform, that really gets you 99% of the way to supporting other 64-bit platforms. I mean, basically, I, uh, I did the port for my code base, one of my code bases at Microsoft in like 1999, <coughs> support Itanium. And pretty much all you had to do was make it so that your pointers were, you didn't use integers when you meant to use pointers. And as long as you do that, then your code pretty much is compatible across all 64-bit platforms. Thirdly, um, actually, it's the upstream's responsibility to maintain, to make this code. So the idea that Ubuntu isn't adding a feature because it's too much work is kind of, in my mind, wrong because ultimately it's the upstream's responsibility to build clean 32-bit code that works on 32-bit and 64-bit. And then, of course, you, furthermore, you have platform maintainers. So uh, inside Debian, there are various people whose job it is to make sure that the code runs on a daily basis for AMD 64 and so forth. So in other words, if you basically can just have a couple people inside your team making your system work on AMD 64, then you bunch of basically can get that for free because you just need a couple people. And there are some out there already. So in other words, I think the cost of supporting multiple platforms has not been quantified and is likely overstated. But I don't know, there might be some others. There might be some other features that Ubuntu doesn't want from Debian. And I'd be interested in hearing what those are. Um, so I believe that Ubuntu is exploiting a loophole in the GPL. I think the, the Ubuntu, uh, we can argue whether or not it's a fork or a um, spoon or whatever, a branch. But I believe it's a fork. Um, we can talk about that if anybody wants to. And, and, but anyway, I believe it goes against the spirit of GPL and cooperation. I want to talk about it. Okay. So actually, what I was hoping we could do is let me just finish my slides and then we can open it up. So, um, I, so generally speaking, I think that changes that when you make a change, you should put that change back upstream and take ownership, so that somebody else doesn't have to learn that code. You know, as again as an example, nobody hands a bunch of code to Linus and says, "Hey, if you've got any problems with it, well, here's the code. Look at it. You can fix it yourself." And uh, let's see here. so yeah, there are obviously many ways to work better together, and this is where you guys can come in. Uh, I propose a couple of solutions. But one of the things I think is interesting is Debian could consider switching to time-based releases. I don't know if any of you read Martin Mischelmayer's thesis, but I uh, took a quick scan at it, and he, it's kind of an interesting paper. Um, actually, let's get this. Okay, I've got a couple of miscellaneous points I thought I would just cover. So yeah, so I got a little bit of advice. I think one, it's really important to focus on the out-of-box experience. Oftentimes I meet Debian people and they believe that they don't care about Ubuntu, Debian is for smart people, and Ubuntu is for, you know, news. And I think that's the wrong attitude. I look at I look at AppGet and I look at Debian installer and I think they're both powerful and easy to use. I think it's possible to do both, but I agree it's hard. I think Debian should keep doubling the number of Debian developers. I think one of the primary responsibilities of the DPL is to increase the size of the team and make everybody happy and productive. Yeah, Wiki, Wikipedia has a motto of don't scare the newcomers. I think that's a good motto. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is the competition. I mean, Microsoft has 5,000 full-time programmers. So it's, you know, it's going to take focus and it's going to take hard work. Uh, also, spend your uh, two hours or eight hours per week productively. You know, whatever time you're volunteering to this community, make sure it's you're spending more time, you know, coding than sending emails. And then also, uh, new software is better than old software. I think uh, I'm not sure how confident Linus Torvalds would feel that his 2.6 kernel is good if Debian isn't using it. So Debian benefits from the changes of the new kernel, and the new kernel benefits from Debian using it. Um, so yes, I have a couple list of challenges. My uh, a few questions for you guys to think about. One is, are Debian developers still passionate? What does a dev mean in a managed world? So if you've got a uh, system where basically it's all written, suppose you had Debian and it was all written in Perl, PHP, or Java, then um, you know those systems each have their own sets of uh, repositories. And so 
what would uh, what does a dev mean? What does a dev repository mean in such a world? So if you could imagine that all that code was written in those on those languages, is it possible to install Firefox off the web? Um, do I have to upgrade my kernel when I install new hardware? Uh, and also, is it possible to build a system where I can never have to upgrade my OS? Okay, yeah, I've got state of Ubuntu in one slide, and I call it buggy. My computer resumes 9 out of 10 times. I have ATI's drivers, but I can't enable Compass or Barrel. Sometimes my 2D graphics perf is slow. It took me an hour to enable playing DVDs, and caffeine basically doesn't really work. Wine did not enable clicking on XEs. I was able to install i6, but does not run. I can't double click on a dev, which has uninstalled dependencies. And few apps are as polished or as reliable as Firefox. All right, so that's it. I just want to say man, there are many ways to work, work better together. Um, I think the goal should be a one tree, one bug database, one conference schedule, and one fat, happy community. And I think Linux can achieve world domination faster if we want. Thank you for your time. So uh, that was all I had to say. I don't really know. If anybody wants to comment, or Could just be something. Where do you work now? Do you used to be at. Uh, actually, I um, am uh, just writing, basically. And, and you did in developer? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I hadn't used uh, any Debian or I hadn't used any free software until I left Microsoft. Basically, I, I quit. I was like looking for something new to do, and I stuck in a Red Hat CD, and I was like, "Wow, this Linux stuff is pretty cool." At Microsoft, we're pretty much discouraged from uh, using free software. So, obviously, uh, because of the viral nature, because it was communist, and so uh, <laughs> well, you know, obviously, that's the opinion. I have a different opinion now. So, yeah. Did they use that word, communist? Uh, well, Steve Ballmer has used that word. I, I'm not sure if, where I, if I heard it inside the company or not. Okay. Uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of questions, okay. so uh, please feel free anyone to, to interrupt me uh, if you want to talk as well. But you, you covered a lot of ground mm -hmm. in that and um, made a lot of, uh, lot of criticisms uh, of Ubuntu in particular that I, uh, I'd like to, to talk with you about. Um, very early on, you, you sort of uh, gave, gave, gave uh, Ubuntu credit for Eric Raymond not being a fan of Etch. Which uh, I think, um, well, prior to to becoming a, a, a public supporter of Ubuntu, which is relatively recent, uh, Eric Green was a supporter of Fedora. Mm -hmm. um, there's, ne there's never historically been uh, someone who, who was a great supporter of Debian and they love Ubuntu. I don't think that Ubuntu uh, can take the blame for a particular high profile person in the open source community not, not supporting Debian. Okay. If, uh, I don't know what you meant, meant that as, as you mentioned that in the context of, of Debbie not getting a large amount of press mm -hmm. um, for. Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. Uh, and I, I guess that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it as, uh, as general buzz. Though I think, it's, I think it's always been the case that Debbie has received uh, a lot of uh, positive coverage within a relatively narrow segment of the press that's focused on, on, on technology and a very, very technical audience mm -hmm. and is not receiving much mainstream press coverage. Um, mm -hmm. I think there, there are many reasons why, why, why that's different for Ubuntu. Um, there's uh, there's um, a lot of uh, both community activity and corporate activity around communicating uh, with the press that I think Debian uh, doesn't get to. Mm -hmm. uh, though there are, there are teams established for that, and uh, it would be great for Debian to see that more of that type of uh, public communication. But I don't think that the fact that Ubuntu Receives a lot of a lot of publicity, detracts from the value of Debian. In fact, a, a very a very high proportion of the of the press coverage that Ubuntu receives credits Debian as its base. Yeah, as a footnote, though, you'd say, wouldn't you? Sure, okay. and a hyperlink. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Twenty percent footnote. And, and in fact, it's often highlighted as one of the things which people like about Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. People who, who use it appreciate that it's based on Debian. They all often have. I have moved to it because they appreciate many things about the Debian system that they realize you know, come from the Debian system, but that uh, they provide add some value for them on top of that. And so, uh, and I, I mean, the larger question though is is a bunch of taking away, in essence, uh, some of the excitement from Debian, basically. That's whether or not Eric Raymond is kind of, that was just an anecdote. 
That's a, yeah, so that's a difficult question to answer. And if if Debian were doing all of the same things that Ubuntu were doing, would people be as excited about Debian? Or I, or another question: If Ubuntu were closer to the Debian community, would I would would more of that excitement bring yeah. over into Debian? Yeah. I think that's hard to say. I think I think a great deal of the excitement that Ubuntu gets is within the user community as opposed to the developer community, and I think that's an area where where, where, where Debian is, is is very strong. Uh, Debian has a lot more developers than Ubuntu. Uh, has a lot more appeal in that community, I think. And so I think there are two different two different sorts of, of attention or. Uh, but you guys are growing your developer community. I mean, you'd like to have a thousand developers, and you're, and you're moving sure, in that direction. Sure, developers are great. Okay. I mean, basically, developers are what make the system. Mm -hmm. So. And we'd like Debian to have ten thousand developers. Okay. Right. I mean, in our case, it's Debian developers who make most of the system. Yeah. Right. And okay. that's why I, I, I have kind of a strong reaction when people uh, paint Ubuntu as a threat to Debian because Ubuntu could not exist without Debian. But if, if, if Ubuntu were to damage Debian to the point where it couldn't where it couldn't, couldn't function, then Ubuntu itself would, would die. I don't think that. But you, that it's an untouchable could be an untouchable consequence of the work that you're doing, right? You, you know, your goal isn't your goal isn't to hurt Debian, but it could happen. And indeed, if it yeah. did happen, that would be something that we would we would see as a problem and respond to. And how would you know when it's going to happen? Well, I mean, we we, we do we do pay attention. Uh, like what? But what metrics do you look at? Um, In the free software community, and having spent some time in it, you know, this is an observation over the years, we run the risk of being our own worst enemy. In that, um, we very easily slip into creating conflict where there doesn't have to be conflict. And those tensions can very easily escalate because people select a set of words which highlights what they are afraid to see in somebody else and then put that out there to prove that that person is what they're afraid that they are. Right? And I see this all the time. I see it happen between other communities. Right? We're seeing it right now, for example, in the Linux community around GPL v3 where someone will say something in a long paragraph and a small portion gets pulled out and turned into a headline and the guys on the other side respond to the headline, not to the to the paragraph. So, um, so I think it's very important within the, within the free software community that we recognize that differences are normal, but those differences shouldn't prevent us from collaborating, shouldn't prevent us from seeking opportunities to make things better. Okay. So in that spirit, I, I mean, I think this was a very, this was a very informative um, perspective. Thank you. And I'm, 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 I find it difficult to agree with everything you've said because I've seen quite a lot of the, the water under the bridge from different sides. Um, I, I feel obliged to make it absolutely clear that there is absolutely no desire on the part of any Ubuntu developer that I know of to, to, to undermine Debian. In fact, most see their contributions to Ubuntu as carrying the, the Debian system forward right? and realizing many of its benefits in new areas. A big concrete um, example of this that you, can, uh, that you can see because it spans many packages is the fact that uh, there are groups of people within Ubuntu who um, make, have made a project of adding desktop files to all the packages where it's appropriate. And many of those patches have been submitted uh, upstream through DevOps and applied by, by the Debian maintainer. Um, it's you know, carrying that data. As, uh, so, sorry, what? Carrying that delta between mm -hmm. Debian and Ubuntu and, and for something like that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense, and that would just be this case for in many cases. So, unfortunately, I started making notes quite late mm -hmm. during, during the talk, so I, I, I can't respond to everything to which I had a sort of a thought at the time. Um, it seemed that it's a little inconsistent to suggest that everything that Ubuntu does, which therefore sort of represents the things that are important to Ubuntu and to the Ubuntu community, right? Which really manifests itself in changes to packages, right? Every single one of those changes is published. We try to do this in, and we've, we've evolved the system effectively, but we've tried to do it in, in all the ways we can think of to make it as likely as possible that that delta 
is as meaningful as possible to other people in the ecosystem, to Fedora, to Upstream, but particularly to Debian, to the extent where, I think I'm right in saying that every single change made to every single Ubuntu package is emailed at the time the change is made to the Debian package yeah. tracking okay. system. Wait, hold on. Now, it's easy to criticize the, you know, to say, well, you know, that patch wasn't done right, or to say that I didn't get a detailed explanation of why that patch was done. Um, but the, the, the important thing is that if every change that Ubuntu made was, 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 was relevant to Debian, then you would expect that every change would be accepted by Debian. Well, right? but the and point I was making that was several slides is the idea that it's important to take ownership. Nobody hands code to Linus and says, here you go, if you got any questions, yes, well, sir. the code's actually, all there. Yes, actually, that's well, exactly, okay. actually, that's exactly how it happens. People in well, the I've been, kernel community focus on things that are important to them, mm -hmm. right? And they publish those changes. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 there are sort of places where those changes get published, and then they get aggregated and fed up through a system of maintainers, and ultimately, hopefully, make it into, in, in, into the... But if there's a problem with those changes, then the person who made the change originally is responsible for fixing it. No. So I that the kernel community isn't, I, I mean, there are probably people in this room who can, can maybe be able to comment on this, but I, mm -hmm. think, but I know it happens even that developers in the kernel community encourage, for example, hardware vendors or developing drivers to submit their code to the kernel, get it in even if it's not perfect, because the kernel community will support them and they will, they will take ownership of that code. Okay, well, there's, uh, yeah. There's a, there's, there's the, uh, what you're getting at drives, there, there are, I think, two fundamental concepts. And we could, we could nitpick around the edges all, all day, but I think there are two fundamental concepts. One is, relates to your concept of, sort of ownership and responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the important thing to realize is that, first, people do the work that they're passionate about, right? And second, that any kind of collaboration requires interaction, a two-way communication. I, I would be very surprised, for example, if a patch was generated in the Ubuntu system, sent to a Debian developer, and that Debian developer then responded and said, what you're doing is interesting, but if you do it you know, slightly differently, then we would include it. I would be very surprised if that, if, if, that, if that response didn't then generate a conversation with the relevant person who was doing that work in Ubuntu. I but I think it's... I think it's fallacious to, 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 to think that, that any party in this collaborating ecosystem can sit back and say, well, I expect everybody else to do the work to the point where I'm happy. This collaboration is an engagement. Well, but, okay, but what we're talking about, though, is do you do the work in the... I mean, basically, you've got two code bases, and they're 99.9% .9 the same. And so there's a, you can say, well, I'll do it in this code base, and here you can take it, and if you've got any problems, you can just do it on your own. I mean, are you saying that people in Ubuntu aren't passionate about getting their code into Debian as quite well? The, quite the not? reverse. Debian, I mean, sorry, Ubuntu developers generally care quite, quite a lot about, about getting stuff into Debian, and it, and it hurts them quite deeply when stuff comes back, you know, saying we're just not interested, stop sending us this, which is the sort of, which is the sort of comment that you might well get back. So, 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 so I, I think, I think you will, there, will, there won't be good results if any one group thinks that it's okay to sit back and, and demand that everybody else do things to their satisfaction. I could make a very long list, right? of things that, that, that make Ubuntu's life more difficult. But it's extremely difficult to, to, to you know, the reaction here would be, would be, would be um, unpleasant if I was to sort of stand up and that list. I chuckled when you said, you know, did you come here with a list of, of work items for Debian? And I can tell you that, that it doesn't work that way, right? You don't show up at DevConf and tell people, you know, what they need to do in their volunteer time. You don't. Well, You, sh you say, okay. these are the things we are passionate about. These are the things we care a lot about. These are the things well, okay, but basically, if Debian didn't, I mean, your kind of assumption is, I believe, that if Debian didn't pr provide another patch, then you guys have no problem with that. You guys would just move forward and improve Ubuntu in any way that you feel like it needs to. Right. Uh, which is not really any collaboration about, okay, the, let's take the this process. The process that you describe, which does happen sometimes, where Ubuntu will have a patch on something, and then, in, you know, the, 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 the Debian folks will take a different approach on that, and then we will review those and sometimes drop the Ubuntu patch in fav favor of the Debian patch. What you should read into that is that the Ubuntu developers actually take time and make and, and put in effort to merge, right? It's hard work. It takes a lot of time, particularly if you think of the balance of probabilities. You've got a couple of 100 Ubuntu developers and 1,200 Debian developers. They actually shoulder much, a much greater burden per developer to conduct that merge process. But it is so important that we actually, we, we, we do every six months, we set aside time to do that process. And it's painful, but we do. If we didn't, 
then increasingly it would get harder and harder to do, and the, and the risks of divergence would get ever greater. And that's okay. what happens with most that's Darian derivatives, as you mentioned, there are many, many of them out there. Yeah. But the, the, the usual pattern for them is that they are branched off in particular ways of Darian, and never really, really, really mm -hmm. from again. Well, but you put a lot of effort into taking away its changes, but you don't put the effort into putting the changes back. I think the, if you want to talk about the fork versus branch, I think you can look at kind of Andrew Warren's tree as a canonical example. And, and he's got his own, you wouldn't call it really a fork, I think you'd call it a branch because periodically he pushes his changes back. And so, and I see Linus pulls from him. Okay, well, okay, but the point is that the changes, I'm not sure where the It's extraordinarily is. important. Oh, okay. Because Linus cares enough. To pull from Andrew, and mm -hmm. has to and has to do a certain amount of work in thinking through when those conflict with Linus's branch, whether he's going to drop them, right, mm -hmm. or and, and hope that that you know his 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 changes make it back to, to Andrew, so that so that so that Andrew picks up the work of, of of merging them, or whether he's going to do the work to merge them himself. It's it, extraordinarily important that, that the difference in those. Okay. Well, it's, it's not purely so, that so, way either. <coughs> you know, there's there's both sides negotiating. Which patches are going to go as well? Of course. Yeah, and, right. part, and part of the an important reason why that relationship works is that Linus trusts Andrew, and often will pull things without having to do a substantial amount of review. And I think that we don't have that trust between uh, the Debian and Ubuntu communities. Well, well, I think that well, Ubuntu does trust Debian to that extent. We will pull a huge amount of code from Debian completely blind and just fix whatever breaks. Um, but we don't have that that trust in the other direction. And that, and that brings me to a point I wanted to, to touch on, where you, did, you made some remarks about, um, about the perceived quality of Ubuntu, which mostly you, 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 you disclaimed as being you know, information that you had heard through other sources. Uh, but that is, I, mean, I, I do hear that, that kind of uh, assessment coming from the periphery of the, of the Debian community. And uh, personally, given that I, I, I put a great deal of effort into making Ubuntu a quality product, I can accept that as, as personal criticism that in terms of the way that the community works, I think that's really toxic to, um, to, to paint that picture and to, to create that, that perception and, and promote it because it makes developers not care about when to not want to look at it, to want to, to just discard it and not, not to collaborate, to, to see it as something which is not what they, not what they want, but there's not value in it. Well, yeah, okay. I, I meant that point I mean, in a couple of different contexts. One is I just heard it yesterday. So, and, and second of all, it's because I think when you split the teams up, then you split up the expertise. So there's a Ubuntu guy who's just doing his work, and he doesn't have the benefit of the expertise of the much larger team. And so invariably, you're just going to find that he's not going to be able to make the changes as well as he would make it if he had the benefit of the other thousand people. So, I think really, four thousand people work on the same. Thing. Yeah. Okay. But, well, benefit. Okay. But benefit of the particular subset of the thousand people who would who could provide feedback. Sometimes. I mean, yeah. But in, in Debian and in open source in general, I think a great majority of useful work that's done is done at an individual level. Uh, the, 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 the great power of Debian is that it's able to aggregate all those contributions together. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have good technical discussions where people mm -hmm. exchange ideas. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Some solution, but. But generally, you know, it's, it's one person who has... Well, one person, has, there's no question, one person has to do the work. But if it's also true that you, you know, send email to various people, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, and you send it, put it, send it to an email alias, and you get five responses from different people, from of those thousands, saying, yeah, well, don't forget this, don't forget this, don't forget this. Mm -hmm. And when you split up the email aliases and split up the teams and split up the... Yeah, and, and, you, and, and collaborating across, and that there will always be different places where, where work has happened. I mean, uh, upstream Debian conservatives, you know, and it's a very hard problem to to reach the right set of people to talk about a particular problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, there, are, there are people who have who post to Debian mailing lists saying, I'm working on this feature in Ubuntu and I want to talk about it, who are, are flamed to a crisp and discouraged from mm -hmm. communicating at all. And it's, you know, the, the way that the, the open source community has these, these, these bubbles where you know, you're working within a particular area and those are the people that you're discussing with. And it's very hard, we find, to, to bridge across those, even between Debian and its upstreams. You know, do you, if you want to talk about a lot of feature, a feature that uh, you're working on for ups, it's not entirely an upstream feature, not entirely a Debian feature, which mailing list do you go to? And that determines you know, whether you succeed or fail in the cases. And it's, so I think, I think it's much more, more complex than, than just saying that, that Debian is excluded from, from, from this. OK, OK, it's not. Okay. Yeah. I want to uh, 
talk about something that I heard both Mark and, and Matt say, and, and the most recent one was Matt saying that uh, Ubuntu developers get flamed for crisp, and I think that's something that we need to um, to discourage in Debian. But I think there um, are a couple cases. There's um, if it's the case that you were talking about, like they were talking about implementing a feature or something, this is something we're doing in Debian, that's certainly something we want to discourage. Uh, although I think there's also the broader case of um, Debian project related stuff that isn't specific to Debian, you know, stuff that would be considered off topic being brought up and, you know, you shouldn't be flamed, but you should just you point out, you know, this is off topic, we're talking about it somewhere else. Um, Mark, a few minutes ago you said um, that there are cases where Ubuntu maintainers have uh, prepared a patch that they thought would be useful to Debian and sent it into Debian and told, go away. And I guess that I hadn't uh, encountered that or heard, heard much about that happening. Um, so does that happen and, is, you know, are there more details around that? Because it seems like that's certainly a bad thing and, um, and also, you know, it's like so it depends on how you interpret it. We have two huge projects, two huge projects. And so we should, we should assume that every form of human social dysfunction sort of <laughs> under the rainbow is, is going to show up. Yeah. And so we can find cases, right, to illustrate any argument. And I think it's just extremely da dangerous to, 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 to poison the beautiful possibility of strong collaboration across two big projects with instances and cases, right? Okay. To me, it really boils down to focusing very strongly on like, what is the leadership? What, is the, what are we trying to achieve and how, do we, and how do we get that done? Yes, there are cases where, 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 where Debian developers have been extremely hostile towards Ubuntu developers and where, where it really bites. See, a lot of the early Ubuntu developers were actually DDs, mm -hmm. so they knew how to work the system and they had personal relationships, right? But, but there are now literally hundreds of developers in Ubuntu. They want to, we say that they should engage with Debian and, 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 and so on. But it doesn't take many bad experiences for them to develop a bit of an allergic reaction to that. We will slap down any time we see somebody internally complaining about Debian. We'll say, you know, you really should you know, try a different way. Try, try, tr try finding someone else and so on and so forth. We, we don't let that turn into a festering wound within Ubuntu, right? But just it, it genuinely makes it extremely difficult when, when a new developer, a new contributor, gets that kind of experience. But I don't want to, if, if we go tit for tat on cases, okay. we'll, well, we'll the, the, be here all day. I, I, think, yeah. I think we have the same goal, and I'm, I'm tr approaching from the other angle, which is if um, the Ubuntu people are doing the right thing and trying to submit things back to Debian, and Debian people are flaming them, we as Debian need to fix that. Um, but in my experience, um, what I see occurring more is that there's the automatic, I can't remember what the system is that automatically generates the patches, but you know, there's the automatic patch generation thing. Um, yeah, but, uh, but I haven't seen um, more what you'd see on the Linux kernel mailing list where um, you know, somebody writes a patch and, and gives it a nice description on top of, um, you know, it's split out into a logical unit of this is a logical patch that, that provides this feature that we added, and, and here's why you would want it. Um, I, I've seen two things. One, one of them is uh, a, a, a comprehensive, like the entire delta between Debian and Ubuntu, and it's broken down a little bit, uh, but not very much. It probably so depends on if it's a normal package or using um, other packaging, you know, CDBS, and so yeah, yeah. Sure. And also, it tries to split out like you know some changes which are obviously specific and things like that in an automated way. Well, okay. Also, we provide incremental patches for each upload. So, as soon as the change is made, there's only that change accompanied by the change log. And it's a very nice Tight. Map. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's, that's so, and the only point I sort of <coughs> just kind of my point here is not necessarily what this what particular mechanism is good or bad. My personal opinion is that it's it's the best thing is if you take ownership of your patch. So, I, obviously, that in, that would increase the cost of for for Ubuntu, but I think. It's, it's much, you know, there, somebody in Debian is going to get a change and he's not going to understand it, right? Well, the Ubuntu person understand it because he made the change. Let's talk so, about what that cost is. Because so, yeah. What would it mean? So, so you take an Ubuntu developer, you know, they're, they're a voluntary community just like any Debian developers do. They've written a patch uh, and they want to take ownership of it in Debian. Well, that's right. So they, they take ownership of an Ubuntu, I guess. And, so, they, and so the question is, you've got this code base that's 99.9% the same. But that, that, that means becoming a, a realistically means becoming a developer 
it's very difficult to make a direct contribution to Debian and take ownership of something that's there without mm -hmm. being, having the, the ability to actually affect that change yourself. And I mean, the new maintainer process in Debian has been through its, its ups and downs, um, but overall it's been, it's been difficult for the two developers who do pursue that to get, to get through. So I, I contribute to lots of packages that I don't maintain and it's not through NMUs. I can I can send patches to any package now. My packages or my patches might be because I'm sending from a Debian.org mailing you know mailing address. Maybe they pay more attention to me. But my experience has been that you know if I have a patch, I can send it in the BTS and and generally it will get picked up um, I've, I've without me having to mute the package. I've some patches on behalf of Ubuntu to, to Debian, which are sitting in the BTS two years later. Um, among these are patches on which stacks a lot of functionality. Now, do you think that's um, maliciousness or incompetence? Or? Well, <laughs> in, I mean, because I have that in, cases in, too. In, but in, the, in the case I'm thinking of, which I think yeah. is illustrated, that the, 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 the maintainer in question has made very disparaging public comments about them too. They may not be related, but you know, draw their own conclusions. And that, and that, that cascades, you know, as I said, I'll probably be on that. There are other patches which can never be merged into Debian without. I'd like to some, make some two philosophical, remarks yeah. possible. One is, you, you told before the perception of uh, Ubuntu by Debian developers. Uh, if, you, if the Debian developers evaluate uh, Ubuntu's quality by its patches, it's usual, usual that they have sometimes bad feelings because, uh, as you say, the, the patches are not always useful and they contain sometimes quick, quick hacks. When you have uh, a package uh, maintained by y Jan Jackson or Colin Watson, and anyone, when they feed patches back, only patches that they know are good, uh, we have a, of course the Debian developers have a good image of uh, Ubuntu maintainers. When the, they have nothing, no maze, and they have to look up, and finally they find out uh, lots of auto tools uh, generated stuff and a few apps because they've got a change mainly in the last uh, week uh, during your freeze. And, uh, for the Required because you wanted to release in time and you had lots of possibility to do the right fix. Uh, it's happened quite naturally this uh, perception problem. And I forget my second point now. But uh, oh yes, uh, you say it's difficult to contribute back to them. It's less and less difficult. We have big teams. I mean, KDE teams, GNOME teams, uh, pair team, Python teams. And uh, lots of uh, Mutu, uh, your new developers, uh, uh, are contributing in those teams uh, currently. And uh, uh, I don't see uh, why you can't can go further. I mean, uh, we are at the point where we have uh, the first uh, Debian developer, we are Ubuntu developers first. Huh? We have uh, Luca, we have uh, Sirechat, uh, and more and more such people are integrating Debian, so I don't think uh, we have that many people who are hostile to Ubuntu. We have, of course, we historically we have uh, we, are, we are known to have harsh people, and, but you can't ignore them. But, uh, we don't have to work with them on their their, their packages. We have enough all the packages where things are going well. I think that's a very good point. I mean, people are motivated by what they want to work on. I mean, you can't say that you know, well, this person wants to to the particular package, but if they can't engage with that person who's responsible for it, then just do something else. And they really want to do that. And if they have the opportunity to work on that package in Ubuntu and work on the things that interest them most, then, then that's what they'll, what they'll naturally tend to do. Yeah. But, but okay, just yeah. my point, real quick, is that when you separate your code base, you basically you're creating an arbitrary boundary. So uh, these people are not these people are passionate about adding a feature, but they actually don't care about what code base it belongs to. So it just so happens they're using Ubuntu, so they contribute to Ubuntu. So by forking the team, you fork the. Um, right. So people are passionate about their work; they're not necessarily passionate about what code base it goes into. So well, many people are. Well, okay. I mean, and and, well, and yeah. also, and yeah, there is absolutely a cost to having having two communities rather than one. Mm -hmm. Completely acknowledge that, and in a perfect world. Uh, that, that, that wouldn't happen. But uh, in, you know, realistically, there are multiple communities working on the same code bases. Debian is one of them. You know? uh, yeah, right. and, and, and there's a division of labor between Debian and upstream, which you know, is, it is not perfect, and often there, there's, there's not, uh, not great communication between them. But, but in the end, they both produce something useful, and, uh, and it works pretty well.
question, a question. So we talked about the, the development process there. What did you say? Maybe we do the threat to Debian. If I look at my team, everybody switched from Debian to Ubuntu. I'm testing the desktop. Well, the server is still Debian, but everybody switched. What is going on in the marketplace? Are you, uh, in terms of installation and downloads, maybe you have this data? I mean, is Ubuntu taking over? Is Debian <coughs> going down and Ubuntu taking off? Mm -hmm. or what's going on? Well, what does the market think? I think it's safe to say Ubuntu is, is, is extremely popular, right? And, uh, and I think that's a very... Here's the fundamental question. Right? Is Ubuntu's popularity bad for Debian or good for Debian? And I would say that, that much, m much of what people love about Ubuntu would have been achieved if, Ubuntu, if we had chosen to derive off Fedora, or drive, or drive off Gen2, or drive off, uh, off OpenCV or Android. So the real question folks should ask themselves is, are we better off, you know, that we have that 99.9% commonality, or we have at least the ability to, to, to set up effective processes to collaborate? We chose Debian because it is an extraordinary community, and you know, we were all Debian developers for a reason. But but I think it's dangerous to 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 to, um, to again to create the sense of division where there doesn't have to be a sense of division. So what is the meaning of a universal OS? Is it one set of packages, one set of binaries? I don't think so. I think the, the, the extraordinary thing about Debian is how people have used it, and usually using it means tailoring it to your purposes, right? All of those guys who are embedding it on set-top boxes, do they ship the same dev binaries that, uh, that, that are in the, the, the Debian archive? I, I highly doubt it. I think they tailor it and they customize it. They, 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 they tweak it. That's, that's what, to me, is the universality of Debian. It's, it is to the whole distro what kernel.org is to the kernel. And, and it, as soon as, you, as, soon as you, you take the view that universal means that it should work one way for everybody, you get into an extremely difficult place. And in fact, I think if Debian took that view, there are a large number of people who currently contribute to Debian who, who, who would struggle. Why is that? Contribution. Because if, 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 they, if they would felt that they were discouraged from actually changing it and customizing it. Think of all the people who work in a place where they take Debian and customize it. So the extra Maduro guys, right? How is what they're doing different to what Ubuntu is doing? The guys who embed it, how is what they're doing different to what Ubuntu is doing? Well, most of those cases are, like, if you look at damn small Linux, right, that's a Debian derivative, but that's, like, what, three guys? Knopix. So, so and, they, yeah, they don't, and they don't have 10 million users, basically. None of those guys have 10 million users. Right, but, so. but so, so this is a profound thing. If you see those 10 million users as a threat to Debian, which I don't, I think there's 10 million users who are now using apt-get instead of yum. 10 million users who are asking ISVs to think about their based packaging, right? The, the values and the, the, the tools, the tool stream, the tool chain are getting propagated. And I think there's an enormous amount that's coming back to Debian. Mm -hmm. And to, to miss that is just to, 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 to poison the well when it comes to collaborating. You mentioned Zimbra in particular uh, as having set up to build uh, Debian packages. If I, if, I, if I remember correctly, they, they, uh, they, they did that at, you know, to, target, to target Ubuntu because they were interested in, in what was happening in Ubuntu. But the result of that is that guys at Zimbra are packages doing packaging in dev format. Well, cool. actually, their announcement, this was a year ago or so, their announcement was that they were going to support Debian. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, my point was simply that if you got, you're just, there's just increased tax by having you know, incompatibilities between the two formats. So it's not necessarily the biggest point, but it is a tax. That's what a lot of these things, I think, boil down to taxes, you know, <laughs> like you can argue about how much they are, how significant they are. But there are incompatibilities between the packages from Sarge and Etch, for example, and it's essentially, it's exactly the same reason why there are incompatibilities between Edgy and Feisty and edgy and itch or whatever, you know, the, the, those incompatibilities are a, they're a fact of life of the, the, the binary um, stuff underneath changes and so the packages are incompatible in a lot yeah, of cases. Yeah, well, it, it, but it's just, you just increase the tax <coughs> by having more, I mean, you know, you, could, you just increase yeah, but the all the Linux distributions have that. Yeah, that's right. And that might be one of the reasons why uh, Linux hasn't taken off, there's all these taxes. No, but I also believe, <clears throat> I mean, people are giving away their time. So as they've mentioned multiple times, it's what you're passionate about. And um, I think Ubuntu took a different approach or a specific approach that Debian wasn't taking so strongly. And uh, 
I mean, I, I don't think you mentioned having one one tree for, for everybody. I don't think that's necessarily good because everybody has to have the same vision, which I don't think the universal operating system can can have because then it's not universal anymore because not everybody has the same uh, vision. Um, so I, I don't think it, it does it does duplicate work, but it also uh, you know it opens up a lot of, of possibilities like what Ubuntu has done to have more more like you said uh, power managing and all, maybe lots of st stuff that wasn't particularly important can get focused on and um, but, I think okay. I think many times duplicating work can 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 actually mm, end up uh, building much more. Uh, even if you're doing some things twice, you're doing a lot of things that uh, wouldn't have been done uh, in a, uh, if, if you would have, everybody would have gone. The but the question you have to ask yourself is, if you, could you have just added better power management or modular X to the Debian code base directly? And what would have been the impact of that? Well, that, I think... Could we have? Could, could have any, have. Yeah, well, yeah, whoever wanted to do that work, yeah, basically. As, as far as I can see, X in the Debian code base at the moment is bleeding edge. It's, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm running the absolute latest X drivers. When I w got a new laptop and wanted to actually compile from source, I, I was only about five commits away from the from, from the head of the tree. I, I don't find that I don't find that f far from the pace, you know. Comparing things like Sarge <laughs> and Facey just isn't fair. Oh, okay. Because yeah. the age difference. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, I, actually, I was talking about. The power management? I'm not sure what you're talking about, the power management. Well, I was just wondering where, what you were comparing with, between what versions well, of Debian and what versions yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was comparing I mean, Edge power management to... Ubuntu works for power management that's been integrated in Edge. It's basically the ACP support package. And, uh, actually, the, actually, the UI the UI isn't there, though. Like the, I, I, when I used a beta batch, I wasn't able to tell it to s suspend. There wasn't a UI there. You didn't install the packages. Well, I just did an edge install. So, I just want to categorically speak for Ubuntu as I sometimes can in a narrow capacity. And that is to say that Ubuntu wants Debian to be successful. And so anything that you can think of that we can do to help that, you know, we will do. We, we expect that in that kind of engagement, that that's a genuine collaboration type of engagement. We want Debian to be successful. And I, I will apologize if, if anybody's had a, a negative experience with Ubuntu. That's that's not the intent. Right? We, you know, we love the values of Debian and we want to carry that as fast as possible to a very wide audience. And, uh, that's why we exist. Likewise in Debian, um, which I can't speak for Debian as a whole, but if there are situations where Ubuntu's, Ubuntu maintainers are trying to contribute their changes back to, you know, what your, is a fir, uh, effectively your upstream, which is Debian, you guys are trying to contribute things back and <coughs> Debian's being a pain in the ass about it, then that's something Debian needs to solve and needs to be brought up to people in the project who's like, look, we're, we're trying to help you here and you're... Uh, and, it's, and it's not always necessarily uh, a, a personal conflict. There is also no sense. It's just a difference in goals. Yeah. Right? In, in Ubuntu, we may have a change which is really important and we'll support a feature that's going into the uh, But in Debian, that's just another wish list. Uh, it's not a priority uh, for that person. Yeah. And I guess if we get to the point where we realize that, and it's a, a difference of technical opinion or priorities, um, then we can look at that and say, okay, it's all right that we're different. Um, and you, know, you guys have a wonderful system to, to keep your differences such that it still allows you to carry them forward and, uh, and use Debian as an upstream, and so that's okay, in my opinion, at least. Um, I think another point I want to address was Debian is based on Debian Unstable. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Debian seems when it's at zero bugs, whereas uh, a bunch of LPS <laughs> <laughs> was just a snapshot. I mean, we, I argued about whether or not that all, means all anything. The, essentially, all the packages that ship in a, in a Debian stable release came from Unstable as well. Uh, uh, but they, they but the bugs were all fixed. Right, they, they go through a process of both different, right. as, as does <coughs> uh, Ubuntu yeah, chooses to make that uh, a time-based time cycle yeah. and, and set certain goals for it. Uh, whereas, whereas Debian takes a different approach. Uh, 
um, we, we freeze very aggressively, we stop taking changes and stabilize it at some point, and we, we put a lot of effort into purely interesting cases. And basing off of one state, I mean, when, when you're, if you're doing new work on a code base, the, the, you work off the trunk. You, know, you, don't have to, you don't go back to a current stable release and start working there because we want to bring the changes forward. You want to stay close to that and refer to your work to be relevant. So that's why we do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it was smart in many ways. I just was pointing out that there's a downside of creating a Ubuntu LTS. I think you were. Yes. Uh, yesterday in this room, there was a guy talking about the Bazaar system. And it was uh, interesting for me. For, I'm an outsider like you are, and I'm an anthropologist, so I don't know really know anything about the technicalities. And, uh, but the, what I experienced more like a, um, an atmosphere at that uh, meeting was that some of the uh, Bazaar people, were, and I think most of them used their, uh, their Ubuntu tag on their uh, laptop. Um, uh, they spoke about Bazaar, and the rest of them, of the audience, were more or less Debianites. Um, and there was no mentioning of the conflict. It was just a talk where there was no difference. And it was uh, very different from now that people bring up a difference. And the difference is placed in the middle of the room, and everybody's concerned about difference rather than just doing the stuff. Um, and then um, that was another thing struck me. Now, right now, could it be possible? If you think in a long-term future, to have something like Bazaar uh, and have the Debian and Ubuntu in the same distributed revision control system, is that a good thing? Is, that, is it completely more or less why thing? we're building Bazaar? That's more or less why we're building Bazaar. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> You probably have a way to go, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we do. Think? Yeah, I mean, like, we do. It, yes. it, it also depends on the uh, cooperation of the two maintainers again, because if you have a bunch and uh, the, the other maintainer has a bunch and doesn't even commit, in, commit to that bunch or doesn't update the copy, which is accessible, you can't even merge with it anymore. So you have to resort to some disconnect meeting or whatever. Uh, but uh, if I have my, my bazaar branch and uh, the person who should have been named now <laughs> has another bazaar branch <laughs> and which didn't get updated in months, I have to read the disk it. Or look at patch the which is equally useless. So yeah, e even when, when the tools work perfectly, they're always consistent. Tools are not, are, are not a substitute for people working together. Right? You would still need that communication technology trying to solve a social problem. It can ease, it can, it can smooth the easy, friction, yeah, yeah. but ultimately there has to be a willingness. Look, people, we're social animals, right? And one of my biggest concerns, since we've expressed a number of concerns, one of my biggest concerns is that within Debian, it is uncool to take a posture saying, we sh you know, here, we should look at ways that we can, we can collaborate more effectively. I've seen, you, you, you've been through this, right? You, you put in a lot of work trying to create systems whereby places where this collaboration could happen. And it's, and it's a painful process. And I think, I really think it's important that leadership in a project, and there are probably a lot of leaders in this room within Debian, think seriously about that and encourage people to, to take a positive view, right? Find ways to collaborate and, and find ways to resolve conflicts rather than dwelling on things that didn't work. Yes, we, can, we can all develop a shopping list of things we don't like. We'd rather develop a list of things we'll, we'll work together to fix. So speaking of leadership, I'd kind of like to hear from, from Sam what you think that we can <laughs> Well, uh, I, I have a lot of things to, to say about the talk and the growing discussion. Uh, one thing that has not been much talked about is management because uh, Ubuntu has uh, roughly 60 motors and uh, about I don't know, 40 uh, core developers well, roughly and Devin has 1,000 uh, not many of which are really active nowadays but uh, I, a good majority of the Debian developers are still active and um, well, it's already difficult to to have them uh, work together, and uh, and they have the same goal, which is make Debian better. And uh, even then, it's difficult. So if you also add to 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 these people people who have slightly different goals, even if very close, such as the Ubuntu maintainers, 
you are very likely to have uh, disagreements, not necessarily fights, but disagreements. Um, those disagreements are really enough to, to slow down things. So I, I don't think it's, um, it's really a problem to have different teams with different people working on the same thing. It can be healthy because different approaches don't always solve the problems in the same way. So, well, I find it I find it usually very good when the same people take care of the the packages in Debian and in Ubuntu uh, because uh, they know what they are doing in in both distributions. But it's not necessarily a drawback to to have different people take care of. Packages and so that's about how I need to, to see my notes because. But when we have two teams, two separate teams, it's good when they can at least agree to share a common uh, source control system so that one can effectively merge with the other. And I think we had several occasions where Debian developers offered this to, to Ubuntu because we have IOS, uh, our uh, collaborative system, where we can grant access to outsiders. And uh, yeah, for various reasons, not always really clear, it was refused. And sometimes, but because it's uh, a bit more rough for even two developers, and they are st tight on schedule and doesn't want to invest in that. And sometimes uh, we don't know. And uh, maybe that's some something you could may push a bit further on your, on your side. Uh, I mean, encourage your your uh, employees and uh, the other Ubuntu developers to accept such offers and uh, I don't know, do you have a policy for, for them to use uh, official uh, canonical or Ubuntu infrastructure or can they do their work in, in our IOS system? No, we prefer folks to use Bazaar for example because it's distributed and it gives people the ability to, 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 to work where they want to work and where it's most efficient for them to work. Same is true of Git, same is true of Material, docs, monotone, you know, pick, yeah, well, pick, we pick, all, pick, pick the tool. We, 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 we definitely don't, you know, CVS and Subversion make it harder to have constructive engagement while maintaining different views because, you know, there is one and only one tip and it's very difficult to, 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 to merge or maintain a delta. Right? Yeah, well, anyway, we, we ultimate, have, we ult 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 ultimately, we, we have to inspire people to want to collaborate. And and if anything, that's where we break down. Uh, two, two remarks. We have a distributed uh, revision, uh, we, have, we have support of Git, Vidader, uh, uh, Arch, uh, H, uh, Mercurial, and everything you want. We have not yet Monoton, but if you want it, you can have it. Uh, uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, your, your teams don't use the revision control system at all. It's a case, for example, from for the Pigeon team. It's Sebastian Bashi and uh, Daniel Oba who are uploading package without any system, so we can't really track what you're doing, even if you want to. They have been offered access to, to the subversion repository in Debian, but they never use it. And uh, I think that's <coughs> it's not problematic, yeah, it's but it would be really better if we could make that, that bit of effort so that we can track Close it more closely what you're doing. Yeah. What's interesting to me there is that your experience there is our experience everywhere else, right? There are many packages now where Ubuntu does the primary does do it does do primary packaging. Not not all of them, but there are many packages like that. In some cases the, the Ubuntu maintainer is also maintaining the same package or is part of the team that maintains it in in, in, in Debian. But so your, your difficulties and frustrations, you know, dealing with that are, are the difficulties and frustrations that we deal with all the time. Yeah, so it's good to see that, this, you know, it is challenging when you're on both sides of this case. Yeah, sure. But I have no problem with that. You can ask me to quit my package. And uh, in fact, I've already done that with all my packages. But I mean, I'm just asking you for those cases I know, but uh, feel free to ask the same to our maintainers. I mean, we have good infrastructure uh, and... Uh, there's no reason for, uh, for, for them to refuse it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you have specific experience where people refuse to, to, to use the uh, VCS, but... Um, Are we supposed to be out of this room now? Or does it go on? There's a talk on open fonts, but we can give you a few extra minutes, no problem. Maybe I can uh, quote the example of what we're trying to achieve with the fonts team. Um, 
so there's a font steam on the winter side and there's a font steam uh, on the edit side and we're really trying to put together. But it's it's tricky. It's tricky. So if you need for a few more minutes, uh, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, thank you very much. Thanks. So I would just leave you with one question, which is there's one Wikipedia and one Linux kernel. So what somehow those guys managed to put it all into one code base and one bug list, one community. Do you think there should be only one Linux distribution? Well, I I think uh, moving in that direction would be a good thing. I mean, I'm not. You can do it stepwise, step by step. But uh, you know, you could try not make the problem worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, yes. But of course, I realize that's a long term proposition. <laughs>